Hi, everybody. My name is Andrea Capere. Thanks for coming to the Northwest Media Summit and joining us for the Impact Storytelling uh, session. And I'll be your moderator today. And I just want to go down the panel here and uh, have us introduce one another ourselves and talk about the work that we do. So let's start with you. Awesome. So we'll do just introductions and then talk about the work. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Swanson. Um, I am the operations manager for a nonprofit called Outside the Frame, and we um, empower homeless and marginalized youth in Portland, um, ages 18 to 25, through teaching, filmmaking, and media production. Uh, my name is Joey Whiting. Uh, I also work with Outside the Frame. Uh, I'm an alumni filmmaker with them, and I now work with them as a peer mentor and instructor. I'm Yuko Kadama, and I'm a news director at KBCS Independent Radio in the Seattle area. Uh, I'm Gabe Shelton Yank, and um, I'm a student uh, journalism intern at uh, Thurston Community Media and helping to invent uh, journalism there, video journalism. And uh, so let's start with uh, you, Anna or Anna? Anna. Anna. Yeah. Um, let's hear a little bit about what Outside the Frame is, or if you prefer, we could start with a video. What do you think? Video uh, or? I mean, I, we'll, we can just give a little. Uh, yeah, I'll give. I'll give the spiel. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, um, as I mentioned, we oh. use filmmaking as a means of uh, providing job training, um, building um, sort of confidence and, and skills, and helping um, youth sort of plug back into society in a variety of ways. Um, we know that they can get a lot of their me needs met through like the homeless youth continuum here in Portland, but um, as our uh, amazing executive director likes to say, like that doesn't feed the soul. So we, what we try and do is feed the soul. Um, and so in thinking about coming to this panel today and the idea of impact storytelling, I think one thing that we bring that's um, unique and really important to the work that we do is focusing on both the impact that we have um, with the folks who are making the work and the impact that we want to have on an audience through the work that we make. Um, so, um, kind of just like an overview of what we do is we um, do sort of boot camps, intensives, usually they're sort of three weeks. Um, we teach all the basics, lighting, camera, sound, and then have the youth um, come up with whatever stories are important for them to tell, often stories related to their experiences. Um, on the streets and um, then produce those films within that sort of three week time span. Um, so that's one of the things we do. We also do sort of ongoing weekly workshops where they can keep plugging into building those skills, telling more stories, um, having that infrastructure and community to keep learning more about filmmaking. And then we do um, really um, sort of robust outreach with the films that they do make. And Joey can speak to that too. He's been um, a fantastic sort of representative of outside the frame out in the world. We go to colleges and universities, to faith communities, um, places like Open Signal, and share the work as widely as possible to really sort of address um, stigma around homelessness and youth homelessness specifically. So anything you want to add to that um, about what we do? You know, I, I, it's, a, it's been really important to me. Like I, I started with this, uh, this group about eight years ago. Uh, as a participant, I was on the street at the time. Um, actually, uh, back out on the street again now. But uh, you know, it it really like it, it it made me feel like I had a voice that I didn't have before. You know, and that's that's what's important about this. You know, is that uh, people? These are stories that people don't really want to hear anymore, because especially in a place like Portland, where it's so. You know, there's such a high concentration of homeless folks that, that people are tired of it. You know, people don't want to hear it anymore. They they feel like they've already heard these stories and it's the same thing. You know, so doing this, like people are more inclined to to go to. You know, we've we've had screenings at the Hollywood Theater. We've had screenings at the Armory. Like people are more inclined to go to those things and sit, you know, and watch a film. And then maybe they might come out of it and be like, Wow, you know, I never really thought about a lot of things this way. You know, and uh, it kind of reinforces the idea that that. You know these these youth on the street are are people. You know, in so much as they're they're statistic, I guess. You know, like it's it, it it's humanizing, and it kind of it sort of forces it to be in your face, and you kind of you see it in a different sort of way. So it's been really impactful for me in that way. 
So uh, do we want to take a look at a video? Yeah, for sure. So um, cool. what we're going to show today is a collaboration that we did <coughs> with uh, Right to Survive. Right to Survive and, and Right to Dream 2. Yeah, and, and with Sisters of the Road. Uh, they were saying, they were loosely yeah. involved. So it's um, with a lot of the groups that are working on the Homeless Bill of Rights here in Portland. Um, and it's sort of a piece that advocates for that. Um, but I think what's really, what we bring to it that is unique and important, again, is that um, the perspectives um, of the folks who are making the work are those that have had experience with what the work is about. So, I think it's I think it's relevant to, to mention um, that this uh, it's called the Right to Rest Act. Uh, when we did this piece last year, it was it was its second uh, attempt. Uh, it's something that they modeled after uh, something that was done in Denver, I believe. Um, it's it's surrounding like the ability to uh, you know to sleep in public, to share food in public. There are certain um, archaic laws surrounding public prayer too, uh, and a lot of these things mostly directly impact the homeless community. And so. Uh, so Denver did something similar where they just kind of, they, they allow people to, to sleep where they need to sleep and, you know, just sort of exist in, a, in public spaces and without being criminalized and arrested, you know. So, uh, yeah, this was the second attempt and unfortunately it failed again, but uh, I'm sure they'll send it back for another rewrite and we'll keep uh, we'll keep pushing it so but it is uh, it's important to note that this uh, piece is one of the uh, finalists in the best of the Northwest so if you're here tonight for the awards program they will be recognized for this and another piece of work it's yet to be seen which one will win <laughs> uh, we don't know yet yeah um, but uh, Yuko would you mind uh, uh, pressing play on on that yeah. To deny any person their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. To impose on them a wretched life of hunger and deprivation is to dehumanize them. If not now, if not today, then why make your promises? This is the thing to educate and make people aware what's really going on in the street. Why is this person on the street? Why we have houseless children? Why is families living in the streets? Why is children and people dying because it's cold out? No matter what level of society or your social status is, we are human and we should be treated like human. And that's what this bill would do and bring back awareness to the people and a demand from the government to recall that humanitarian spirit to help people that believe in this American dream and it's failed enough. You can wait till morning comes, you can wait for the new day, you can wait and lose this heart, you can wait and soon be Southwest Portland. Four deaths in the last ten days. One who died of hypothermia. A man was likely living in the woods and had been dead for a few days. I've been houseless in my early years of being a single mother. It has been a blessing to be accepted to the Section 8 program. So they help pay a portion of our rent and there's a small curse with it too because kids age out. I've had a daughter that was houseless. Most parents can say, yeah, come back home until you get stable or whatever. I wasn't able to do that. She did live in her car. She, she lived in her car pregnant, and my other grandson was three. And Now love's the only thing that's free You must take it where it's found Pretty soon it may be cause of day Here in Portland, if you're looking for a place to sleep 
People can come down and harass you, kick you around and tear at your tent. The police can say, you can't sleep here, you can't sleep here, you can't sleep here, but where do we go? We need to have a safe place to sleep when the shelters are overcrowded without being criminalized. You can't stop from sleeping. It's a human right, and that's all we ask for is sleep. And with proper sleep, people can become successful. You'll have less people in jails. You'll have less people in hospitals. You'll have less people on drugs. You'll have less people developing mental issues. It's not now. What then? It's a hell of a thing to be told that that you are doing something wrong by existing in a space. I've, I've stayed up all night long just because I it wasn't safe to sleep anywhere. Nelson Mandela said once, to deny someone's basic human rights is to challenge their humanity. And a bill like this, it, it humanizes people. It's a we thing. <laughs> we gonna do it. Power to the people. <laughs> I think I can speak a little bit about uh, impact of just, we have similar legislative activities happening in Olympia, Washington, where we work and live. And uh, you, taught, you mentioned that it was a failure. It feels like an enormous success to have created a piece of media like that. But can we talk about the impact um, for you and for your communities? Yeah, so I think impact obviously is gonna land in a lot of different places um, like where where are we having an impact what kind of impact um, this is definitely one of our most successful sort of like online pieces I would say um, it definitely has like the most views on our Vimeo page um, which for us is like a lot of views is like 1500 um, but that's it's yeah we're, we're like vibing on that um, we sent it to um, like Ted Wheeler and various folks who make decisions in the Portland area. Um, I'm pretty sure Too we never heard response. back yeah. <laughs> from any of them. So the impact there is a little bit um, unclear. Um, and as maybe you can speak a little bit to the impact in terms of being a participant, making it. Obviously, we see Joey in <laughs> in the piece. Yeah. Um, in terms of in terms of this specific piece, I think uh, the the impact has mostly been, uh, I guess, uh, thought motivation. If any, if nothing else, you know, like at least it's getting people really thinking about these things that people don't really think about. You know, uh, we did another piece uh, last year also for um, for the affordable housing initiative uh, that actually did pass here, so we like to take some credit for that, I think, <laughs> if we can. Um, you know, but at, at this point, we've, um, like this is, aside from uh, the, the workshops, the, the, the weekly intensive workshops that Anna was talking about that we do, uh, this is a lot of our goal, is, you know, finding these um, social, social justice issues that, that directly affect uh, the houseless community, and, and particularly houseless youth, and you know, do what we can to to make that into something palatable to the general community to try and stimulate, you know, uh, at least, if nothing else, thought around those ideas and maybe uh, try to motivate a little bit of change in, in reactions to the houseless community and, you know, get people to realize that, uh, you know, not just uh, statistics, you know. Thank you. I mean, that's deeply humanizing work. Um, 
I'd like to move on to Yuko, who works at KBCS, um, and uh, her format's a little different. It's radio. Um, I was hoping you could talk about your role at KBCS and journalism and also share um, the product that you brought for us today. Sure. Uh, so at KBCS, uh, we have a news department that is open to people who want to come in and learn about journalism and um, try working on stories of their own. Um, so we kind of train in, in how to identify kind of angles, uh, stories, get into an interview, use equipment, um, and then cut if, uh, for edit it and, um, yeah, and, and voice and so forth. So how to create pieces. Um, also, I, uh, am, I really like to source content from other local media as much as possible. And I had been a part of um, Listen Up Northwest um, through Reclaim the Media a long time ago in 2007, where I uh, produced a show each week and I would source all of the content <coughs> from local um, community radio stations throughout the region, including Alberta and BC and Oregon, Washington, Montana, um, Alaska, and so forth. Yeah, so uh, that's kind of in a nutshell what I do. Yeah. And uh, there's an opportunity there for this cross-platform uh, production of, uh, be it television news that you uh, uh, export audio and share. Have you ever thought of doing something like that? Or Yeah, um, so that's how we did this. Uh, it, it was a, the Listen Up Northwest was a syndicated um, show each week that went out to 13 stations throughout the Northwest and it, it was free. It could be picked up by whomever. It was, a, it was already made up as a half hour show that can be used by anyone. And then we credited all the local stations for it. I'd like to try to get something going where we post things. You know, there might be one place where um, different radio and, you know, if we can rip audio off of video um, to, or, you know, just open it up as a place where people could source content and then, you know, let us know if it's okay to cut it from, you know, because usually we can't put out hour-long pieces, but we could take out six-minute pieces and then credit the person and send them, you know, send them to whomever has the, the full piece, so. So share with us and give us a little context for the um, for the audio that you're going to play for us today. Yeah, um, this is just an example of something that we've done. It's um, a piece where um, quite often when we go out and do an interview on a topic, those people will keep sending us other people um, when they get a sense of what we're after. And uh, as a small you know, radio station with one full-time employee <laughs> in the news nice. department, you know, um, they, uh, they get to, we, what we tend to do is we try to highlight people and their personal experiences and honor their experiences. Um, so uh, when people get a sense of that, you know, what, we're try what we tend to kind of focus in on, um, they send other people to us and uh, there was uh, one organization that works with uh, domestic violence victims. Um, they sent us a group of people who they call themselves thrivers, um, not survivors. And uh, um, there were four of the four in this group, and we kind of came together and talked about what you know how what they thought was important for people to know about, and then we would kind of you know went through you know, what, what their story was, and they were able to metabolize their story, and then we put it out. Um, so this was one of the pieces from that series of, I think, five pieces altogether. So... Hit okay, hit escape. Thanks. <laughs> I am not a video person. And then person. if you click back into iTunes, you can uh, okay. just hit the space bar. Hello, my name is Courtney Weaver. I'm a 26-year-old vocalist. I am also a survivor of domestic violence. On January 15, 2010, in Arcata, California, I was shot in the face and arm 
but my boyfriend at the time had a little 45 bullet, shattering my right arm, narrowing through the right side of my face, shredding my tongue in a diagonal line over to the left side of my jaw, and obliterating most of my manacle, lodging the remaining bullet fragment into the left side of my neck until it was abscessed and removed. I had had 13 reconstructive surgeries, hundreds of doctor appointments, equating to $440,000 in debt. Three years and nine months later, I'm finally thriving and gearing up for my comeback as a professional vocalist. In the first year, I really was very fearful. And when I moved back to Seattle, I finally had an amenity instead of living in a small town where I was constantly questioned by people every day about what happened and you know, why did he do that and what the backstory was. And so when I moved to Seattle, to my hometown of Seattle, I really felt as though I wanted to be anonymous. And I feel at that time I was much more fearful that he was going to come after me and get me for talking about my story and breaking the silence that so many domestic violence victims are silenced by. And I feel, because of all my healthy self-care, as well as recording and rebuilding my voice, I realized that I can't live that way. I didn't survive something that traumatizing and terrible, only to end up living in fear for the rest of my life. And I don't believe living in a place of fear is living at all. And so I find myself getting stronger every time I talk about it. The thing that I was told by the prosecutors was don't say anything that he could use against you. And I kind of bucked that. I never got a bad order, but you know, they definitely said that silence was the best answer. And I, I don't believe that that's the case. I don't believe that silence is going to fix this from happening to other people. And I think that instead of me adapting in fear, to whatever he could possibly do, that society needs to learn to accept that I'm not the minority, that I'm not to be marginalized, that I happened to survive being shot in the face, which is very, very rare. It's like, I think 5% of people survive being shot in the face. But the circumstances surrounding that is not that uncommon. And people need to stop asking questions about me and start asking, well, why did he do that? What was going through his head to think that that was okay to do to someone? I would tell someone who was going through a domestic violence situation that it's, it's never black and white, and that the most important thing you can do is educate yourself and always make sure that you have an exit strategy or a backup plan and just make sure that you're looking out for yourself and that you're setting things up so that you can protect yourself because your life is valuable and that speaking out about it may be difficult but the culture of silence is doing nothing to mend this behavior from continuing and for someone who knows someone going through a domestic violence situation, I would be really easy with them. I would be the first to say that, you know, education is the most important thing that you can give this person. But just do your best to be there for them because they don't have anyone looking out for them. They're not looking out for themselves. And that the most important thing you can do is be unconditional towards them. I know that what they're going through is extremely difficult and that there are things out there like safety plans and things like that, but it's very hard when you're in a domestic violence situation to have control over your finances or to have control over anything and that it gets so much better once you've removed yourself from that situation. You deserve better and you don't deserve to be treated that way. No one deserves to be physically hurt or verbally have your mind messed with. That's not what someone in love does. That's what someone who lives in fear does to the people they care about. And it's not your responsibility to fix them.
It's hard to clap for that. Yeah, I think we're all kind of like, how do we acknowledge that powerful piece respectfully? Um, thank you for sharing that. Tell us, how did that story come to you? So that was um, from a, I had interviewed someone from a service agency um, about their work, and then they sent me this group of women, and each of their stories are very powerful. Um, uh, basically wanting to, you know, just uh, that domestic violence lives in silence. It thrives in silence, so they are trying to bust that open a little bit um, so that uh, other women can be empowered to, you know, um, take whatever, you know, precautions or um, make decisions as they need and know that they're not alone. So um, we get, so quite often, you know, I'll do an interview and then they will send me other people and it just kind of turns into, it turns into its own kind of a public affairs for the station because, and, and it becomes our kind of public relations, you know, because um, we kind of spread out that way. And then when um, we put a broadcast a story, we put it up on the web and share it on social media, and then it kind of ripples out from there. So um, it's, it's a nice way to, to honor the community and uh, also, you know, get a little, uh, Com coming back. <laughs> so. so as you said, that <coughs> audience uh, then goes beyond simply that college radio station, but um, also online. So did you have any direct uh, experiences shared with you by the community about the impact of that story? Yeah, there are people that will call in and thank us, you know, um, for, for different stories. That one was one of them. Um, I mean, we also get calls from then men who get, you know, uh, upset about that too. So, you know, it's an interesting, it's interesting how these kind of more emotional stories bring out, you know, interesting emotions from, from the audience. And uh, so um, those are less, but... I should hope yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, I see that as kind of... Uh, the way that we work. Um, we also tend to like to go out on the street into, we have a series called Unmute the Commute, where we um, identify, you know, people that, you know, uh, doing something interesting or if it's something about transit, but we will interview them in a bus and then we'll also interview them outside, get the sounds from the bus and kind of layer it all together. So. Um, uh, having that feel of being out on the street, um, you know, being out on the street and talking to people, I think is is um, a nice way to, uh, you know, like f be in the community as well and um, and meet people where they are. And there's something really uh, vulnerable about audio. I think people feel a little more comfortable about telling those stories. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, we're going to pass the computer down so uh, oh, Gabe can put in his, uh, yeah, his flash drive I, or um, you're happy, if you're happy to drive. I think he was saying maybe to watch it with this cord. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, good, good, good. Oh, okay. Just, okay. Just, yeah. All right, good. <laughs> so while we're uh, ejecting this, uh, this drive here, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit. Um, because I supervise uh, Gabe uh, at Thurston Community Media. He's uh, my intern. Um, and uh, at least uh, for this semester, I have him part of the time that he's at Thurston Community Media. The rest of the time, he's working on government productions. Um, so uh, in, the, um, in the winter, he asked me if I would supervise him for this uh, journalism internship. And I didn't really know the scope of what he really wanted to do. Um, but he attends the Evergreen State College in Olympia, and they have these phenomenal opportunities for students to design their own learning. And um, so he developed this independent learning contract in collaboration with his professor and with me, and uh, that stalled me enough. So Gabe, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, so, um, gosh, these are both so powerful. Mine's a little more lighthearted. Um, so I kind of wish I went first, but, but that's okay. Um, uh, so, I mean, what we're doing is like a really new 
thing. There, you know, there's there's not a current journalism internship at Thurston Community Media. We're we're inventing it, and I'm the the self-imposed guinea pig of this experiment. <laughs> um, you know, and it kind of came from the idea, like we were talking about how. Olympia is a really politically active community. Like people will go out in the streets and uh, make their voices heard. But the, you know, the the local media really doesn't reflect that commercial, like the commercial media. You know, on the one hand, it's they're they're really like kind of bleeding money. So you know, there's obviously the economic difficulties of covering all the things going on. But you know, even the when when they are covered, it's it's. Just really, it's really bad. I don't, you know, like I'll see an article about a protest where it's it's basically just a bulletin of like quotes from the police chief, you know, and it's like, well, did you actually go and see what happened, or did you just like call the police department and then write an article with some quotes, like, um, you know, and um, and so we were thinking like, you know, so that kind of led us, led me to the topic of uh, grassroots activism and, and as like a topic to cover, and then so uh, we're creating a, a journalism, multimedia journalism internship program around um, covering grassroots activism and, and issues in the community. Um, and I'd like to add a little bit about just sort of the environment in Olympia. Um, we are 60 miles from uh, the network affiliate in Seattle. Yeah. Um, we have uh, one local newspaper that gets thinner and thinner and thinner. It's owned by McClatchy, uh, so most of their um, their news stories are national and uh, or related to the Seattle area. So while we are in a capital city, we have very limited coverage of uh, local issues. Um, we also have um, we have some smaller outlets that um, you know reasonably cover the bright side of news. Um, but we have this feedback also from our community, our viewers, the people that um, are involved at Thurston Community Media that say, why don't you do news? And so that's just a regular critique that we receive. And, you know, as, you know, a small organization with four cable channels and, you know, 11 FTEs, it's just an enormous challenge to put on, you know, a regular news program. So we thought, well, we got to start somewhere. And how do we start? And how do we build capacity? Right. And this is where this Democracy in Action project took place. So rather than talking your ears off about it, we're going to show you. Oh, well, I kind of wanted to say something. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to stop talking. Okay. Um, <coughs> a full-time employee. Um, yeah, so it's called Democracy in Action. I didn't say that, but that's what it is called. And um, um, I just wanted to say that ultimately the, the goal is to, we'd like to create this into like a real internship program. You know, and it could be anything from like in the future, there's one intern doing what I'm doing now, but you know, all the way to like having a full time staff member and a group of interns doing this. Um, you know, and a lot of that is going to depend on like being able to find a funding source like a grant and you know, and then seeing how this whole thing goes. And so right now it's, it's very um, experimental. You know, I'm just doing most of the production myself, uh, finding um, different stories, you know, just uh, studying and learning as much as I can. And, um, you know, just trying different uh, formal practices in video and then also kind of dipping my feet into like writing articles and using uh, social media and so hopefully out of this we'll be able to like pull together uh, a, a concrete thing that is ready for the future so that you know this can be carried on and there can be you know we can we can help add another voice um, to the local media that isn't being heard yeah and so yeah um, so thank this you for telling me that you weren't done talking <laughs> that was good um, so th this isn't and what's funny is this isn't, I don't, this isn't even my favorite one, but, but um, this is the one that got the most views, so I just figured I'd, I'd show that one. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I kind of just threw this together at the last minute because I heard about this protest going on at the Department of Licensing, which if you're not from Washington, that, that's the equivalent of the DMV. Um, and um, yeah, and then it, it ended up, I guess, like uh, resonating with a lot of the participants and you know, it kind of got shared across all these different uh, networks, different like 
community groups, Facebook pages and stuff um, throughout the state. So I'll just go ahead and play it and then uh, go from there. I didn't even see that before I left for the uh, summit, so he finished it while I was down here. Great job, by the way. Um, so uh, I, I want to continue on this theme of silence because that happened really quietly, that decision internally by that agency to make choices that impact people's lives. So this would have gone unnoticed. Um, so oh, yeah, media. silent plug. <laughs> um, so, Gabe, tell me, why do you think that this struck a chord with people? Um, well, I, I really wanted to show it, but I couldn't get a good shot in there. But there was actually a Como 4 uh, news crew there um, at the same time as me. And I felt a little bad because I was probably totally in the way of their shots. But, I'm, you know, I'm also trying to shoot stuff, too. Um, um, but, you know, we were, we were just talking. And someone was like, oh, Como, they're with... Uh, Sinclair, right? Sinclair Broadcasting, and and yeah, they they are. And um, I, uh, you know, I shared it with with the with the people that I talked to, and um, you know, after I made the video, and I think I think because it, it was consciously trying to amplify their voices rather than give this somehow removed objective picture of of the events. Um, you know, I wasn't like yeah, I was really just trying to. Get, share their side of the story and you know have a, as much 
of their interviews uh, fill up the video as I could. Yeah. So I want to thank you for that segue into the um, Sinclair Broadcast Group and the conglomerization of media in the United States. Um, and maybe we can uh, start by just sharing our thoughts, and I'll start with you, Anna, um, about the role of this type of journalism in um, dispelling myths, in um, in sharing factual local information. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think one thing that comes to mind that I'm really impressed by with what we just looked at is it seems like a pretty quick turnaround, and I think that's one of the challenges and things that um, I feel like we, so we're not making work that's going to respond like the next day necessarily because of the access that we have to resources and the fact that we're doing this also as sort of an educational initiative and want to have that kind of impact in the, in the lives of the folks that we're working with. Um, but I think that also accepting that sort of slower timeline allows us to tell stories as you're doing as well, sort of that are like digging in deeper and really amplifying voices that wouldn't be amplified in that way. Um, and to, to not have to be on that sort of like news cycle of just like getting stuff out, but to really like take a look at the issue as we did with our piece and um, like get a bunch of different voices in there and really sort of make connections that are not gonna happen if you're trying to turn something over like the next day. So I think, yeah, I've, I feel like watching these things, I feel very aware of those differences and how conglomerate news media and the work that we're doing, um, that we're all doing, um, how those differences are like sometimes frustrating but really open up other avenues and possibilities for the, the way that we can have an impact. What about you, Joey? Um, I feel like you pretty much said most of what I would uh, be likely to say in, yeah. in that regard. Do you want to talk about the impact we have on audiences when we do outreach, like this Monday? Oh, yeah. Um, so I guess sort of re related to the, the question at hand, we uh, it was about a year and a half ago that we got our 501c3, right? It's been about a year. Uh, like two and a half. Okay. Yeah. I'm, a little, I'm a little off. But uh, we... Been doing stuff for a long time. Right, been a but be, for a before, years. Yeah, before uh, we got our 501c3, we were just uh, sort of a, a subgroup of uh, outside in. Um, if you guys don't know who they are, they're, they're I think, the biggest of the, the homeless youth outreach uh, organizations here. Mm -hmm. um, so now, now that we're our own uh, independent group, uh, people are starting to kind of hear about who we are a bit more, and uh, it's 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 been a little bit odd for me because we've been uh, we've been going to different uh, universities around the state and uh, speaking to um, like uh, media sciences groups or or uh, different uh, social work majors. Um, so last week we went to Pacific University and gave a presentation there. And you know, it sort of it sort of reaffirmed to me that that this model works, you know, because a lot of these people would would see these these pieces that we show them, and and they would be like, wow, you know, like these these media majors would be like, wow, you know, I never really considered like using media for these sorts of things, you know, and um, so it's really cool that like it is clearly like doing what we're trying to get it to do, which is like, you know, break down the stigma that like, you know, we can do things, you know, we actually do like, uh, have, I don't know, we have uh, strong opinions and like actual voices, you know, we're trying to make a change in our, in our community, you know, and it's, it seems to be working. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so. absolutely. I would also add that I, I think, um, because we are coming at it from a filmmaking perspective um, and then making this kind of work as well, we're kind of like uh, like dipping our feet into both sort of a journalistic world and more of like a art creative world. And um, I think that allows us to approach storytelling in a more flexible way. And then also, again, to have those things <coughs> Um, live in different spaces and specifically then to take them places and be like, we're going to screen this as opposed to um, 
the way that uh, other ways that news gets disseminated, um, and and then to have more conversation around it, and um, yeah, really have people watch and then have those moments where their perspective is, is shifted and we get a lot of good feedback on that. And I think, I wanna say last year we screened um, our work for like 1,100 people across the year and we're on track this year to have like 1,500 audience members. Um, and I don't know the exact numbers for this particular piece, but um, being able to have those like in-person screenings as well as sharing stuff online and then broadcasting it through Open Signal and Metro East Community Media channels. I think just like broadening the impact is a um, really important technique. It is something that, that was very uh, eye-opening for me, I guess, in a sense, because as, as someone, like I've, I've been homeless most of my adult life, you know, like I never went to college, you know, and then I'm, now I'm going and like speaking to, you know, 40, 50 college students about you know, what I do, and it's, it's good, it works. That's huge, I mean, you don't have the audiences of hundreds of thousands of people connected uh, uh, through, you know, network television, but you're actually changing the hearts and minds mm -hmm. of people. Um, Yuko, would you like to say something related to this? Yeah, um, in regards to kind of the climate of media right now, because things are so, you know, slammed on one side here, you know, it, out out in the the mainstream media, it starts, it's really kind of ticking over and people are noticing it. So um, our radio station is the source for um, Democracy Now! and Tom Hartman, and they just have just gone up the roof, you know, I mean, just through the roof in terms of um, listenership and, you know, money coming in during those shows. It's really interesting to um, to watch that. Um, I also think that this kind of climate is bringing uh, journalists together, at least in Seattle. Um, there are a lot of smaller kind of media, like uh, Crosscut.com, South Seattle Emerald, International Examiner, the Seattle Globalist, these are smaller places where they tend to focus in on, um, like say the Rainier Valley, which is kind of uh, an area that has a lot of low income and, and very diverse um, populations. Um, and uh, they are getting, they're, they're getting more readership, I think, because people are wanting uh, alternative <laughs> sources of information. And then these groups are coming together and collaborating more. We, I just went to um, a meeting with like uh, 30 other um, you know, very, very kind of journalistically up there, um, smaller kind of groups recently, Crosscut and KCTS um, Television and uh, all the, uh, Sociedad Emerald and uh, yeah, all these different kind of smaller places that we got together and we we're like, how are we gonna address you know, we've been addressing homelessness together like for one day of the year, you know, for the past couple of years. How should we, what should we do now? Can we collaborate, you know? And there's a lot more of us getting together and talking about things and, and pitching stories to each other, which is kind of interesting because we know what each other's um, <clears throat> strengths are. So they'll come to me and they'll be like, oh, I've got a story for you. It's the Black Panther Party, you know, mm -hmm. 50th anniversary. That is you this weekend, that. right? They're, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and we put out 12 pieces on it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so I think that's been interesting. Another thing that I've been um, seeing as behavior within house is, you know, as the fact checking stuff is becoming less out in the mainstream, um, depending on the area, depending on which news sources, I feel like I'm, you know, upping my fact checking, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm checking in, I'm checking public records, and I, mm -hmm. as I interview people, I'm checking more, and that's good for us as well, and I, I think um, that's been interesting. Um, and then I feel like it's, kind of emboldened our radio station to like pitch things out to other stations and also um, pitch it out to, um, actually we, we just got, uh, last year, one of our stories went out on All Things Considered. Mm. And so I think there's an interest in, you know, at large 
you know, if they're going toward NPR, they're kind of wanting more of this too, um, since they're starting to pick up more of our things and, and it also emboldens us, right? Like in, it, uh, so that's been interesting. And um, yeah, I, I'd say that uh, I've noticed that, you know, the way we've kind of been approaching things a little bit differently, well, not differently, but something that we did was um, there was someone who was a wheelchair, you know, um, using wheelchair and trying to, you know, navigating the bus system, mm -hmm. right? And it's very frustrating for them. And uh, so we did a story on that. And then we were like, you know, why don't we get you to talk to the bus agency mm -hmm. and we can be there, witness it and be taping it. So we did that and we got that as part two. And then that actually got us a Cronkite Award um, mm. last year. But, you know, just to be able to help, you know, like, okay, we did that. Now let's take this another level and see where that can go. Um, and yeah, it, it was, that was very interesting. So, you know, of course, I followed up since we got the Cronkite Award and, you know, there's, she's said there were some differences, but, you know, there's definitely a lot more work to do. <laughs> well, I love what you said about um, the current atmosphere, you know, um, deepening the need to um, protect journalistic integrity and, uh, and protect truth. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to move on to uh, Gabe, who's new to this business. Um, and uh, now that you know, and I mean, you've been a student of media production for some time now, and you're a senior about to graduate, looking for a job, by the way. You saw what he's capable of. Um, I, got, I got cards. <laughs> um, now you know, how, you know how the sausage is made now. So tell us a little bit about, like, what have you learned, like, in the process of making these things? Um, that's a great question. Um, I guess, you know, one of the advantages of not being under this big corporate structure is that uh, we have the power to, to advocate for things. You know, like in your case, you can say, support this resolution on the city council, you know, and whereas like, you couldn't just, you couldn't just say that if you were working for, you know, another media organization, or like you can do a story about survivors of this like horrible domestic violence, and then you don't have to call the guy and ask, you know, for his quote. You know, you don't have to be like, well, hey, well, we need to give you five minutes, too, to explain. You know, and, and it's like always fact-based, always fact of course. Like, you're not just like making stuff up to prove your point, but, you know, you can have real fact-based analysis and, and take a position on these issues um, without, you know, without having to, without like a, a large structure over the top kind of, you know, dictating what, what kinds of things you can say and, and having a, you know, an advertising base that they have to, you know, worry about offending. Um, and that's, that's really, that's really the one, of the, one of the cool things about community media, I guess, we can do stuff like that. Thank you. I think we've run out of time, so I do want to acknowledge our uh, panelists and open it up for oh, questions. No. Oh, okay, questions. <laughs>